Love some bacon on a biscuit and let's go. We're burning daylight. Welcome to the Frontier Freedom Hour with Jeff Hunt. Sponsored by Centennial Institute at Colorado Christian University. Now, here's Jeff Hunt. Howdy, friends. This is Jeff Hunt with the Frontier Freedom Hour. So in light of the historic attacks that took place this week in Israel by Hamas, we're kind of doing some special podcast broadcasts. And I'm talking with Dr. Tom Copeland. He's the director of research at the Centennial Institute. He has taught on a wide variety of issues related to public policy, national security, international relations, terrorism, and the American government. Dr. Tom Copeland formerly served as the chief of staff in the government service services division of LexisNexis, working with the FBI, DEA, INS, SEC, DOJ, and TSA, and was director of missions at the Institute of World Politics. He's written and edited a number of books, one Drawing a Line in the Sea, the 2010 Gaza Flotilla Incident and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, as well as author of Fool Me Twice, Intelligence Failure and Mass Casualty Terrorism. So, uh, Dr. Copeland, thanks so much. Obviously, we work together. You're the director of research here at the Centennial Institute. So let's go back to the, uh, the attack itself. You've been an expert in terrorism, intelligence analysis, you're watching the news come through Saturday morning, I bet. What's your first response when you start to see this? Well, as they clearly Israeli intelligence, which has, to this point at least, always been world-renowned for their excellence and their ability to track people down. You know, after Munich and so on, they're, they're legendary for um, their effectiveness uh, on the ground. But they clearly missed this. And uh, I wrote my dissertation and that book on intelligence failures. And there are a number of reasons why those things happen. I was thinking, okay, so what was it? Was it that they didn't understand a change in Hamas's strategy? That seems pretty likely. They didn't understand the change in Hamas tactics, like paragliders and parachutes and just breaking a hole in the fence and so on. So they're surprised. They failed to understand tactically how Hamas had changed. And um, I think they also kind of let their guard down, uh, whether it was... I mean, they've really been distracted by internal politics in Israel, right? The 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 uh, the case against Netanyahu uh, for corruption, questions of reforming the Supreme Court, and so on. And um, at least recently, they've been distracted. But it still doesn't explain why they had no idea that this attack was happening when it probably has been in, in the planning for at least a year. So, it really, questions whether Israeli sources in Gaza are as good as they thought. So let's go back to kind of how Israel has traditionally dealt with Hamas. I've heard this kind of phrase, this term, uh, cutting the grass. Uh, every once in a while, Hamas pops up. It's something that Israel has to deal with. They respond in force. They dismantle. And Hamas tends to just kind of go away for a while. And that has been going on for years and years and years now. So that was kind of what Israel was traditionally used to dealing with with regards to Hamas. Talk about that history. Well, yeah, Israeli uh, counterterrorism has looked like that for a long time. And really, if you go back to the massacre at the Munich Olympics in 1972, that was when Golda Meir really established this policy of hunting down everyone who had been involved in it. The The Steven Spielberg movie, Munich, is definitely worth watching if you don't know anything about that that story. So they, they, they've done exactly that, so sort of cutting the grass. They'll take out a few senior leaders. Uh, they have gotten a couple of the original founders of Hamas, um, sometimes with, um, you know, missile attacks, sometimes direct assassinations. Um, and they'll go in periodically, even when there's not a, you know, an incursion. Um, when I visited Israel in 2010, we got to meet with uh, some folks from Shin Bet, and other organizations that, who are practicing their snatch and grabs. So they would go into Gaza, grab somebody out, bring them back to Israel to put them in prison. So they'll do that either for individuals or they'll occasionally arrest larger numbers of folks. And they've put a lot of them in jail. And then eventually they end up negotiating and releasing a lot of them. And they seem to be okay with that. Um, so yeah, they've cut the grass, they've lowered the leadership, uh, you know, the level quite a bit. Um, but it's it's kind of it's not exactly kicking the can down the road, but it clearly has not been effective in stopping Hamas from really, really growing. 
that was the sense I've heard from other Israeli leaders that this attack was something that they had never even seen from Hamas before. This was on a whole different level. Talk about the tactics of the attack itself. Um, missiles being sent off almost as a distraction, right, from attacking the, the fencing itself. Um, it, get into kind of the details on the tactics that you saw. Well, let me say a word first about what Hamas tactics have looked like in the past. Um, certainly where they've been firing small numbers of rockets into Israel at random points, sometimes to make a point. But so they've been doing these low level rockets and they're not they're not well guided. Uh, they tend to land in areas of Israel that are not well populated. And the Iron Dome system has been capable of shooting almost every, everything down. What that system does is it it picks the ones that are likely to hit a populated area and it goes after those. So it will allow rockets that are going to land in a farm field somewhere to go ahead and land because that saves the number of missiles they have to use. So Israel's been dealing with that threat from Hamas. But they, you know, they're famous for their role during the Intifada's of suicide bombings, killing hundreds of Israelis, but sending suicide bombers onto, uh, you know, workday buses, into restaurants, uh, to a place called, was called the Dolphinarium, which was a, basically a nightclub in Tel Aviv and uh, blew up several dozen uh, kids who are partying there. So they've typically been involved either in individual suicide bombings or knife attacks or those kinds of things. Sometimes a sniper will attack, but it's always been that sort of low level kind of stuff. Although I mean, that's not to minimize the intifada and the, and the terror of the, the suicide bombings. But this time they show their capability to coordinate in a whole bunch, bunch of areas. Um, it, it kind of like when uh, bin Laden engineered the attacks on the U.S. embassies in um, in Kenya and Tanzania back in 1998. Suddenly they realized that Al Qaeda had the ability to coordinate activities that were hundreds of miles apart. So that's the big change with Hamas this time. They sent out naval units to try to attack up the coast. They used their you know they don't have an air force, but they used these paragliders to simply fly over the security barrier. Um, use bulldozers probably purchased through UN money <laughs> um, to, you know, blow these big holes in the security barrier to send their uh, their troops through. So it was probably this combination of like air, land, and sea that was really unusual. And the coordination all across Gaza, I mean, it's not a huge area, but still it's a fair amount of coordination, new technologies. Um, and they really kind of showed in some ways, unfortunately for the Israelis, the, the challenge of the security fence, which is just a fence. Um, even if it, been a, if it was a wall, it would still need military reinforcements behind it and so on. And um, so, yeah, this was a significant change from what Hamas usually does. So Hamas orchestrates this big attack. They, they, they go right after citizens, right? This isn't just a military v. military uh, campaign. They're kidnapping, uh, raping, torturing decapitating, I mean, hor horrific things. What is their goal, you think? What is Hamas trying to do? Obviously, they're not going to be able to compete with the Israeli army. So what's the point of this? Well, there are a couple of things I think are, are going on there. Hamas has always been, you know, trying to, to irritate Israel and draw overreactions. So I think one of the, one of the main things going on here is they want to use, they're, they're using basically ISIS tactics, right? Remember that ISIS did all this stuff, videoed it, you know, kidnappings, executions, beheadings, all that stuff. So they've taken a page out of the ISIS playbook to make things obviously as worse, you know, as, as worse as possible, trying to get Israel to overreact, trying to get Israel to invade and in the deaths of thousands of, of Palestinians and so on, which of course Hamas has put them in that situation. So I don't blame the Israelis for, you know, the Israelis are careful to not target civilians, but there are going to be civilian casualties in this. But they want there to be such a huge response from Israel that other Arab countries will back away. And the key thing there is that it's really not Hamas's goal, it's Iran's goal to stop Israel and Saudi Arabia from finally having a peace treaty. Um, that's the that's the big prize because Iran sees now that other countries uh, in the Gulf and in the region are aligning with the U.S. with the Saudis and kind of encircling them, and so they want to drive a wedge between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So that, I think that's the big like geostrategic plan that's going on there. It's really Iran's plan and not Hamas. So let's dive in a lot deeper on that. Okay, um, 
funding for Hamas, does it come from Iran? Large amounts of it do. I've seen estimates anywhere from 70 to 90 percent. Um, they find Hezbollah in Iran almost completely. So remember that Iran is a Shiite country, and the Hezbollah, the, the so-called party of God in Lebanon, is also Shiite. Um, Hamas is Sunni Muslim, and they usually don't cooperate very well. In fact, they're often at war with each other inside of Iraq and so on. But uh, Iran, probably since the 1990s, um, has been working with um, you know, with bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, with Hezbollah, and they've developed a much closer relationship with Hamas. And so they're willing to work kind of across religious party lines uh, to do that. So Iran clearly has provided funding over the years. One of the major things, they have to have provided training. Um, the, 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 the terrorists who, who flew in paragliders and so on, combined operations, um, certainly would have had to have trained somewhere else. Um, I mean, possibly in Yemen, um, possibly in Iran itself. But there would be no way for them to practice, you know, paragliding a ATVs across Gaza City without the Israelis seeing it. So they had to practice somewhere else. So Iran provided that. And unfortunately, we provided some of their weapons. Um, because when we left Afghanistan, when we fled from Afghanistan in 2021, we left behind billions in American hardware. And the Taliban very quickly delivered some of that to Iran, and they've smuggled it into, into Gaza. So there are America, as I as understand from a news report this summer, that there are American weapons that are being used. In place. Let's talk Biden administration, $6 billion to Iran. Did that have anything to do with this? I don't think so. Um, you know, the White House has been at great pains. Even earlier today, I saw um, Kirby, um, the, the press secretary for the National Security Council, talking about this. And again, saying, well, not one penny of the $6 billion was spent on this. I'm like, well, yeah, because it is still sitting in a bank in Qatar. That money hasn't done that. But Ayatollah of Iran, right after we paid them the $6 billion or freed up the $6 billion, um, said, we'll use the money however we want. And money's fungible. You know, you, you, you want to go buy something and you don't have the money for it. But then your uncle says, hey, by the way, I'm going to send you a check for 200 bucks. You'll go ahead and make the purchase knowing the $200 is coming in shortly to, to backfill it. So, um, I mean, Iran has been funding Hamas for years. Um, so whether this six billion, and this six billion was not technically used, but Iran has had at least six billion free. Uh, the bigger question really is the probably $80 billion that Iran has made in oil profits in the last three years since the Biden administration withdrew all the oil sanctions. And I think my, my frustration with the the strategy, such as it is from the Biden administration, has been, I think they're simply trying to create Obama's legacy. I think Obama wanted to be the man who finally brought, you know, a nuclear deal to Iran that would create this lasting peace in the Middle East. It didn't happen while he was president. Now that Biden's in, everything they have done has been to try to get back that uh, Iran uh, agreement to limit their nuclear programs. So, uh, Iran has made tons of money from that narrow-minded focus on getting Iran back into a deal that they will never follow anyway. So in what world is this actually achieving peace, right? So you say the Biden administration wants to have peace in the Middle East and they're going to get Iran to the table on a nuclear deal. And that same com country that we're talking about wanting to have peace with is just funding Hamas to go after and create all these problems in Israel. So what? maybe there is no answer to this, but obviously the Biden administration's inept in achieving peace in the Middle East. Trump seemed to have done much better with the Abraham Accords. What's your analysis of Biden's kind of success in the Middle East? Well, I wouldn't call it a success. I, I can't think who it was who was saying during the, the 2020 campaign that Joe Biden has been on the wrong side of every single foreign policy decision in the last 40 years. I mean, he's been in Congress since the 70s. He's been there for everything from from the end of Vietnam to the Persian Gulf War to the response to 9-11. Uh, you know, he's been wrong on all of those. Um, I don't see him going the right direction in this one either. Uh, it is this very strange fixation on, you know, 
Iran's you know, leaders are people we can deal with. We, we can figure out how to appeal to them. They're, mo- quote, moderates in power. And so we'll get them to agree to this deal to not uh, develop nuclear weapons. But Iran thinks that that's, you know, an order from God is to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, and they've got lots of friends out there from China to Pakistan who will help them do it. So, um, yeah, it's a very odd unidimensional strategy. And you don't get a sense that there's been a strategy around Ukraine. I, you know, we're, I don't know, almost two years into it. No direct conversations, no direct peace discussions that the U.S. is brokering or anything. Um, we just simply kind of keep keep pumping money and weapons in, sort of allowing Ukraine to bleed while they bleed Russia. Um, now, I'm, I'm not suggesting what the right policy would be on Ukraine, but there's no strategy there. Um, there's no strategy in the Middle East. There's no strategy towards Latin America. Latin American leaders just a week ago basically called out the administration to say, you need to have a policy for Latin America. Um, so there's just this really strange void in, um, in strategy from the State Department and the Pentagon and the White House. Let's talk where this goes. What are your predictions on Hezbollah, Iran, Israel, Saudi Arabia, deal, all that? Well, I think in the short term, um, Hezbollah probably is holding off on a full invasion until Israel has committed its best troops to Gaza. Um, you know, the Israelis are just a country of 10 million people. And while they have hundreds of thousands in the military, the folks who are full-time military are being transferred from the north down to the Gaza border for the incursion there um, to try to wipe out Hamas. So it leaves basically IDF call-ups, National Guardsmen, right? They, they, they train periodically, but it's effectively National Guard units in the north. And uh, Hezbollah has, uh, last I read, 130,000 missiles. 130,000. And these are not the unguided JV rockets of Hamas. These are advanced weapons that they've gotten from Iran. And so there's a real danger of that northern front opening up. The threat from Syria isn't that serious. Syria is not in a position, I don't think, to get involved much. So they might they might get involved, but they don't contribute much to the fight. Um, so short term, I think that's what's likely. I'm One of the things I'm starting to worry about a little bit is uh, yesterday, for example, both some some guy in the Ministry of Education in Turkey basically said to Netanyahu or in a, in a tweet, like, one day the gun will get you too. So very threatening. And then Erdogan basically backed it up. He was like, why is the U.S. sending aircraft carriers to the east, uh, to the east of the Mediterranean? That's not needed. Why are they doing that? And um, so my worry is because Turkey and Israel have always had a very, very much a frenemy relationship, sometimes good, sometimes not good. Um, Turkey generally has allowed Israeli uh, aircraft to do training over Turkey, for example. Um, so, the, But they also disagree over Syria and certainly Hamas and the situation in Palestine. And so um, I'm, I'm beginning to be a little bit concerned that if Israel has success against Hezbollah, that Turkey might actually get involved somehow. And that would be bad because then we've got a NATO versus, I mean, Israel's not part of NATO, but then you know, is the U.S. compelled to push back against Turkey? So that's, uh, I, I think that's more of a risk in some ways than a direct war with Iran. Um, now, that, of course, depends. And the Israelis have made it clear that they will stop Iran's nuclear program. My sense is they're going to focus on trying to fix the problem internally. But at any point, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we saw a massive raid on Iran's nuclear program. Um, the Israelis will certainly lose fighters and so on, um, but I, uh, I, I suspect that may happen at some point soon. There was a movie by Tom Cruise about you know getting the missile in directly. <laughs> they didn't mention Iran, but you kind of got the sense that uh, they might have been hinting towards that in, in Top Gun 2. Let's to talk Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel's relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, I, if Iran's goal is to disrupt that, did they achieve that? Well, it's too early to tell. Um, certainly the talks were getting closer. Uh, just a week or two ago, or maybe it was late September, Brett Baer was in, interviewed both the Crown Prince in Saudi Arabia and Netanyahu, and both seemed to indicate that things were moving along at a good pace, that they could anticipate something soon coming from this, um, and that might have been part of that trigger for Iran approving the Hamas thing, because, again, they want to try to force 
the Saudis to back away from that deal. And we're, we're in a weird position with this. You know, the Abraham Accords have been very successful in getting peace agreements between Israel and a number of the Gulf states. But Saudi Arabia is the big prize. Um, they're really still effectively the, the leaders of the Muslim world, the, the Sunni world. And um, the administration's policy towards them has also been strange. Um, you know, very soon after getting into office, the Biden administration um, was criticizing uh, Saudi Arabia over uh, the assassination of Khashoggi, the, the journalist and so on. Um, and certainly, I mean, Saudi Arabia has, you know, I mean, I think regularly commits a variety of, of human rights violations, probably because of the imposition of Sharia law and so on. But the fact is Saudi Arabia and Israel, at least, are clear-eyed about realpolitik, right? Like, look, we don't have to like each other. We've got a bigger problem over in Iran. So we need to put aside our differences and work together enough that we can contain a nuclear Iran. The, the crown prince said also this summer, like, well, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, we will have to. And then pretty soon everyone else will. Egypt will, Jordan will. Um, and nobody really wants a Middle East that's driven by all of these Sunni, Shiite, Christian, Jewish, uh, you know, challenges. Nobody wants a nuclear Middle East. Um, so that's, I think, what the goal is. I mean, Israel has nuclear weapons. The Saudis know that they could use that as backing in pushing back against Iran. Um, so it's very important that that peace deal go forward. Um, but we'll have to see how, basically, how the Saudis respond to what Israel is response. Is there a likelihood of a Hamas or jihadist attack in America anytime soon? I, th I think the case is pretty strong for that. Um, now, our intelligence agencies have done a very good job since 9-11 um, of stopping large-scale terrorist attacks in the United States. We still have had some. We had the, the shooters in L.A. and so on. Um, there have been a number of smaller incidents like that. But if you look at the numbers crossing across the border, I just saw yesterday that there are tens of thousands of people from countries of, countries of interest or countries of concern, including Yemen, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, um, you know, and completely unaccounted for. Um, so I don't know that there's an army of 40,000, you know, Hamas members inside the country, but certainly terrorists with bad intention have come into the country. Um, and I think, you know, it is much easier to obtain weapons and explosives and so on inside the United States. Um, so I think there's a real danger of that happening. But, and the way they operate often is sort of retaliation. It's kind of, well, if the U.S., let's say, send special forces into Gaza and Palestinians are killed, then that might activate folks here to carry out an attack. So I'm quite sure that um, the, the the Joint Terrorism Task Forces, the FBI, National Security Division, intelligence folks are all, you know, checking everything they can in the networks to figure out if anything can happen. But there's definitely a danger. What's your advice to Israel in the next few days, weeks? Oh, that's hard. Um, I, I'm inclined to believe what I've heard from a number of other folks that they really have got to fix the problem. Uh, they really are going to have to go in and really eliminate Hamas leadership. Um, I think there's a challenge still, though, that, you know, the Gaza Strip is a very much smaller version of Vietnam. And how do you how do you detect the Hamas guy from the regular Palestinian? If the Hamas guy takes off his green headband and throws his gun in the trash. It's very hard to, to figure out who's who in there. Um so it can be, it will be very bloody. I mean, the Israelis will lose a lot of soldiers fighting house to house, door to door, um, you know, in the, in the rubble, trying to search for people, um, or, you know, there'll be bombs and so on that are set as booby traps for them. Um, but then certainly, I know there are going to be thousands of Palestinian civilians killed uh, in the process of trying to wipe out Hamas. Um, and I, I do feel bad for the Palestinian people. Um, I think they... You know, they didn't ask for being barricaded in some ways inside the Gaza Strip, but they're that way because of Hamas. Like the fact that the border is secure and there's a naval blockade and so on is a product of Hamas really deciding they, they are going to try to take on Israel. If there's time, let's say one more story that indicates kind of why, you know, why does Hamas hate Israel so much? Um, and of course, they're, they're long-term anti-Semitism. There are things that Mohammed said about killing all the Jews and so on. Um, there are also verses that go that talk about 
treating Christians and Jews with some respect. They get the demi, you know, second class citizen status. But in Islam, you don't sort of compare scripture to scripture the way that you do in, in, uh, in, in the Torah or in the Christian tradition of the Old and New Testament. Um, you, you can take either verse and run with it. So some Muslim leaders will run with the treat Jews and Christians as second class citizens, but don't kill them. And others who say, no, you should kill every Jew. So there's this long-term religious thing, but shorter term, um, Hamas wants to get rid of Israel. And they're saying, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free and so on, but that's not enough for them. When I was there in 2010, we visited um, an Israeli prison for convicted terrorists. And um, we met with about a dozen folks from Islamic Jihad, Hamas, Hezbollah, and so on. And uh, there was a commander from Hamas who was there. He's a very powerful figure. I've never met anybody else who was quite as dynamic, even though he spoke a different language. He was just very charismatic. Then we asked him a couple of questions. And, you know, there are these two terms in Islam. Peace is salem. Tr a truce is called a hudna. And Muhammad told his followers, you know, if you're in a bad position, you can declare truce with your enemies, but you can always break at any time. So we asked this Hamas commander, well, if Israel would give back the West Bank and Gaza completely, now they had given back Gaza, but if they, if they gave those back, would you have Hudna or Salem? And he said, Hudna, just a truce. He said, what if Israel completely left all the lands of Palestine? You know, if they were, if the Jews were completely gone from Palestine, the entire region. Um, and he said, Hudna. So then we asked him the final question, what would happen if all the Jews were exterminated from the face of the earth? And he said, Salem. That was the only terms under which Hamas would say that peace was finally achieved, was by eliminating every single Jew. They have that genocidal intent. Uh, and so it concerns me when, you know, misinformed, miseducated uh, people in the U.S., are chanting these pro-Palestinian slogans and promoting Hamas. They really are the definition of anti-Semitic. They're supporting a group that wants to eliminate every Jew. Uh, and that is something that I, I think as, as Americans, uh, as, as conservatives, as, as religious people, as Christian, Jewish, uh, maybe Muslims in America, I think uh, should not stand for that kind of blatant anti-Semitism. But that's what Hamas really wants. They want to eliminate the Jews. Colorado Christian University has signed statements uh, standing in support with Israel. We continue to pray for our brothers and sisters that are over there uh, suffering. Uh, it's very clear where CC stands. I'm proud of our commitment to that. Um, Dr. Copeland, thank you so much for joining us. Director of Research at the Centennial Institute. Great background in intelligence. Go to drtomcopeland.com, Dr. Tom Dr. TomCopeland.com, and you can read his writings there and learn more about him. This has been a special episode of the Frontier Freedom Hour. You can listen to all of this at FrontierFreedomRadio.com. Until next time, God bless you, and yeehaw! <laughs>